Thanks. Good to see you. Audrey, Tristan, great to see y'all. We're back. How are things going for you? Smoother. Smoother. <laughs> Less bumpy. <laughs> Less bumpy. The daycare come along okay? Yep, I have full, I have four full-time kids as of right now. Wow. Yep. That's, That's a good thing. That is wonderful. That's true. I'm not doing anything to be able to earn money and pay bills, but we're okay now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So yeah. she, she went from one extreme to the other. She went from working at a nursing home to working in daycare. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. Good Thank to have you. Good to see the rest of y'all. Good to see the rest of y'all. And uh, I just pray that you'll be safe headed home. Yeah. Kind of keep your eyes open for trees and tree limbs and things like that with the wind blowing the way that it is. Uh, we're just praying that everybody will be spared. I know that I prayed with Charlie on Friday that the Lord would help protect things. He already had three trees down on the course Jeez. on Friday, and that's before the wind, so he's very concerned. And you might find this interesting that the golf course, the clubhouse, is on a different electrical system than their house. No, they're, they're just a few hundred yards apart. One of them is Carroll Electric, and the other one is AEP. And they're on two separate. And the one on, I guess, Carol Electric is the very end of the line. And it goes out a lot. Yeah. So we just pray that everybody's going to be kept safe. Good to have you here this morning. We're going to have our prayer time here this morning. I want to comment on a few of these names. And uh, maybe you've got some names that you'd like to share. Under the grieving families, in addition to the Trello family, John Tate, who was listed in the middle of the second column, he passed away, so we need to pray for him. And in the middle of the third column, Howard Kane, that was Heather Ferguson's uncle, he passed away. And by the way, Heather wanted to say, wanted me to say hello to everybody. She misses everybody. She wishes that she could come back here from Colorado. So do keep those families in prayer that are grieving. Susie is doing well with her treatments. So far, no really adverse reactions. So we rejoice. Daniel McCauley, he's the second name I talked to Aaron last night. Daniel was able to go back to work. So we praise the Lord there. He's still kind of, he lost 40 pounds in this process of being sick. Ellen and Lou, Mary's sister, is home. She went home this past Tuesday, and she's doing well. Mary has been staying with her at nighttime, so we rejoice there. Clyde, on March the 4th, a week from this Monday, is going to go back to the doctor about, you know, where he hit his head. Uh, they're still monitoring to make sure that the blood that was up in there has all disappeared and that everything's okay. So keep him in prayer. Hank Benson was here on Thursday night for the jam session. Uh, he said within the next two weeks they're hoping to do that carotid artery surgery, so keep him in prayer. The doctor said it's not life-threatening right now, but he's anxious to get that taken care of. I was going to ask uh, Kay Chase if she knew anything about Rocco. Does anybody know anything about their little grandson, Rocco? how his procedure went. Okay, I'll have to find out later. Barbara Melto at the bottom of the first column. She did go home from the hospital, so we rejoice. Um, she did, however, check herself out of the hospital, so we pray she's gonna be okay. In the middle column, about a third of the way down, Wayne Kemp did get his oxygen machine, so we rejoice that he got it. It's not really helped him with his breathing. He still gets out of breath. And that's because his heart is bad. But do continue. To figure out how to hook it up to the lawnmower. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, he does love mowing grass. In the last column, um, my mom continues to do well. I think that it's probably going to be maybe next week when she will get the medicine that they're talking about up at Pittsburgh. But my mom's thinking is really good. Uh, in fact, last night playing Scrabble, she had her biggest Scrabble play ever, 129 points. Jeez. So, we just rejoice. Rachel Coyle, Susie's friend, is still praying that they can get her seizures under control. She's had seizures. And then toward the bottom, Dwight Welshans, he's still at Marianne Manor. Would you like to comment about Dwight? Mary? He's doing better since they took him, took that pain medication, was making him hallucinate and everything, and really out of it, and I told him that's too strong for him, 
and they finally took him off of it. And now he's back to his normal self. I was over yesterday and took him potato salad and he ate every bite and sloppy joe. And we played two games of cards. And All right. Did great. <clears throat> so if anybody's over in that direction, Mary and Manor, you just go in the back door. And I mean, there's not like a doorbell. You just kind of make yourself at home. And Dwight is in the front room, uh, front right hand corner room. So. I know that he'd be delighted to see folks. So keep him in prayer, and Mary as well. She's doing a great job. And then toward the very bottom of the third column, Bob Baker, um, he had to go back into the hospital the other day for infection, so I hope that they got that cleared up. Then we ended up adding the name Jeff Cheeks. This is a co-worker of Deb Aftanis. He had some heart issues. And then we're praying for our travelers. That Chuck and Bessie are traveling today. We pray that they'll be safe with all these windy conditions. So maybe there are additional names or needs that you'd like to share at this time. Jean. Joe Hornick, the son there. Yes, ma'am. my granddaughter-in-law's father. Last Thursday, he thought there was nothing wrong. He went to, he thought he had pneumonia. He went to Med Express. They sent him right to the hospital. And yesterday, he ended up having six bypasses. He's on the induced coma. And he's only 61 or 65. Wow. So, Needless to say, she's very young. Oh, yes. 61 years of age, in case you couldn't hear. 61 years of age, didn't know that anything was wrong. We went to Med Express, had to have six bypass operation. He's on an induced coma right now. Jeez. Only 61. And he's the relative again of... This is my, my grandson's father-in-law. Grandson's father-in-law. Yeah. Joe Hornick. Yeah. The very last name of the last column. So any of these others, I wanted to comment too that Mary Stacey in the bottom of the middle column, she had her procedure the other day and that went well. It was for the place of, um, I want to say a, a tube or something. But it went well. I did talk with Dan. So are there any others that we need to mention? Thank you for telling us that, Jean. Uh, Debbie Wendt, Bucky, is, I see her name on there. Uh, yeah, she... Uh just went back to work, so you, uh, you're doing okay. Take her name off. Okay. All right. Well, we're glad, glad that she was able to go back to work. No additional names or needs? Okay, well, let's pray together. Father, it's good to be here in your house this morning, and we're thankful that we're able to make it. We pray that you'll keep us safe <coughs> this day. We ask, Lord, that you will help to prevent massive power outages, keep trees from falling on people's houses. We just ask for your mercy. We pray, Father, for those that will be out working. There will be a lot of power companies out trying to get things up and running. And pray, Father, that you'll protect those workers. But we're thankful that we could come. We're thankful that we have the freedom to come. And we're thankful, Father, we have a, a warm, safe place to meet. We pray that you might be honored this day as we continue to try to lift up your name. And that, Father, you might know that we love you more than any, anybody or anything else in all the world. Because it's from you that we've received every good and perfect gift. So we love you. We thank you. We pray, Father, your continued blessing upon each need, both the spoken and the unspoken. We pray that you might minister to these that we've talked about this morning, the grieving families, the Trillo family, John Tate family, and Howard King family. Lord, be, be near their families. Comfort them. May they sense your nearness. Give them strength as they adjust to their loved one not being here. We pray your continued blessing upon Susie. It's good to have her here. We're thankful, Father, how well she's doing. And we just pray that you'll take care of this tumor completely. We thank you that Daniel McCauley was able to go back to work. Pray that you'll continue to help him get stronger. Thankful that Eleanor Baru came home from the hospital. Pray that you'll continue to strengthen her. Help her to be able to gain some weight. We pray for Clyde as he goes back to the doctor on March the 4th. That he's going to get good news about this place where he hit his head. We pray too, Father, that you will help him to be okay. We pray for Hank as he has this upcoming surgery on his carotid artery that that might go smoothly and that he could be restored to health and strength. We're thankful Barbara Melto is home. We pray that she'll do well at home. We pray for Wayne Kemp that you might help to strengthen his heart, help him to be able to breathe better, Father. We're thankful. Thank you for getting an oxygen machine to him. Continue to meet his needs. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless Debbie Wynn. Grateful that she was able to go back to work. I'm thankful again, Father, for what you've done for my mom. Pray your continued blessing upon her, especially as she made 
in the upcoming weeks have to take some new medication, but bless her. We pray for Rachel Coyle that they will get these, these seizures under control and pray, Father, that you take care of the tumor that she has as well. We ask you, Lord, to continue to bless Dwight Welshens to strengthen his legs. I know that he'd love to be able to go back home, but we're thankful that his mind is working better. We pray for Bob Baker that you might help him over this infection that he's had. And we pray for Joe Hornick, Father, that you will bring him through this sixth bypass. Help him, Father, to heal up from this heart surgery and pray, Father, that you will help to nurse him back to complete health and strength. We pray for Jeff Cheeks, who also has had some heart issues, that, Lord, that you will minister to his needs. And we pray for those that are traveling, that you will keep them safe. We thank you again, Father, for this time, and we pray, Father, your continued blessing upon it. Guide me in what needs to be said this morning with regard to the message. We pray, Father, that you might help us to love you more. Bless our country. Bless our president and vice president. Keep them safe. Give them wisdom. Help our leaders to fear you. We pray, Father, that our nation might turn back to you. We need revival. Send revival amongst your people, Father, that we will get back into your houses of worship. And then, Father, as we oftentimes do, we pray for our military and law enforcement that you'll bless them and their families and keep them safe. Thank you now for this time. Use it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 119. The whole thing. I'm just kidding. Some of y'all that know about the 119th Psalm know that it is extremely long. No, we're not going to do the whole thing this morning. But I do want you to turn with me to... 100, Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. There are probably a lot of psalms that I could have ended up choosing, and there are probably some passages from outside of psalm that I could have ended up choosing. But today I keep continuing this theme, this love theme that we focused on all during the month of February. So far we've talked about loving the world, because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son and I told you when I preached that message that many times I get so upset with the things that are going on in this world and I have to be reminded that God loves this world even though I may get angry with it and you may get angry God's heart is one of love he loves this world he wants to see this world turn back to him then I preached a message the great commandment is what first and great commandment Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's a lot of things that Jesus said not was most important. Some people end up thinking, well, loving my family is the most important. Nope. Loving my job is most important. Nope. Loving my fun is most important. Nope. Loving people, other people, most important. Nope love God. <clears throat> then last week I preached a message the second great commandment was love your neighbor as yourself which prompted a lawyer to say well would you please define for me who my neighbor is. And Jesus basically told the story of the Good Samaritan. He said your neighbor is the person that's hurting that needs help. And so we're trying to keep this theme of love and today's message is about loving the Word of God. How many of you love this book? I do too. I think. In the back of your blue hymnal. There's some pledges. We have a pledge to... The American flag. We have a pledge to the Christian flag. And we also have a pledge to the Bible. What does the pledge to the Bible say? I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. And will make it a lamp is my feet, a light is my path and hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Why do we have that in there? Because we want to foster within people 
a love for the Word of God. And I just want to talk with you this morning about what I love about the Word of God. I'm going to read this passage of Scripture. The psalmist wrote this. Um, we're not exactly sure which one, or at least it's not listed in my Bible. You might end up asking, well, why is the 119th Psalm so long? How many verses are in the 119th Psalm? 176 verses. 176 verses. But do you notice that this song has a lot of stanzas? Does your Bible have above the first verse a symbol and a word that says A-L-E-P-H? Yes. What is that? My Bible got a symbol and B B E T. Okay, and that's when you that's go down good. to the, the ninth verse. It has a symbol in B-E-T-H. But there's Not eight B. verses in each one of these groups. Do you know what those are? The Aleph, A-L-E-P-H, and what Corey said, B-E-T-H. Do you know what those are? You probably didn't know this about your Bible. You've got the entire Hebrew alphabet there. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so they wrote a song that the first word of that song in Hebrew started with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. When you get down to the ninth verse, it shows another stanza of the song. It starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that word is Beit. When you get down to the 17th verse, you get to the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Gimel. Those are the letters, if you were to open up a Hebrew Bible, those are the letters that they use to write in Hebrew. Some of y'all didn't know that. So they started each one of these stanzas of this song with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and that's why there's so many verses. Just like we have A through Z, they've got all of these letters of the alphabet, and they ended up starting with all of them, all right? So I'm looking at the second stanza of the 119th Psalm when I start with the ninth verse. And this is what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can any person keep their way pure? The answer is by living according to your word. Then the psalmist said, I seek you with all my heart. Please do not let me stray from your commands. You recognize this next verse? Where have you heard it before? In the place of the Bible. I have hidden your word in my heart so that I won't sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that came from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. See, the psalmist is extolling the importance of the word God. Now, granted, when the psalmist wrote this, you didn't have any of the New Testament yet. And you probably didn't have much of the Old Testament. Most of the prophecies probably had not been written when, it was, when this psalm was penned. But the psalmist was trying to tell us something about how we can keep our lives pure. When I think about what the Word of God has done in my life and what it's done in the lives of my parents and my family, not that we're perfect, and what it's done in the life of our country, it is a treasure for helping to get our lives straight now. 
I, I don't want to digress here because I've got some other things that I want to say with regard to the importance of the Word of God. But does it come to any sur a surprise to anybody that as our churches shut their doors? And a church is a place where the Word of God is preached? That as we continue to see the church doors close, that the condition of our society continues to go down? There's a connection be between the Word of God, and that's what the psalmist ended up understanding. There's a connection between living according to the Word of God and the purity within our lives. This morning I'm going to speak about some general generalities about the Bible that I hope and pray that will be helpful to you, but these are some of the things that I treasure about the Word of God. I treasure that there are two parts of the Word of God. What are the two, maybe I should be more specific, two halves to the Word of God? What is it? Old Testament and New Testament. What does the word testament mean? What's that? Things that happen. I associate the word testament with testimony. You know, it has been said that the Bible, the entire Bible, is a revelation of God to mankind. It is a written record of how God has revealed himself to us. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself to us in a different way than he revealed himself to us in the New Testament. The Old Testament, God revealed to us the importance of the law. The law was given by Moses. And God ended up giving us a lot of laws by which we should end up living our lives. In the New Testament, he revealed to us not that those laws weren't important, but he revealed to us his grace. What is the, probably, if not the old rugged cross being the favorite song of the church, what song would be the favorite song of the church? Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. So we've got a revelation of God. Two, two different ways that God has revealed himself in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, it is in the person of Jesus Christ. What do I value about the Old Testament? Well, I've told you before that one of the things that I value the most about the Old Testament, it reveals that where we came from. You know, I've spent some time here recently. I know you all think that I, I spend way too much time thinking. It's just my nature, okay? But I've ended up thinking about the brevity of life. Life is short. This past week I've thought many times, come next year, and I just turned 57, but come next year, I will have been out of high school 40 years. 40 years? Are you kidding me? Where in the world? I was talking with somebody this past week. It's been over 35 years ago. It was 35 years ago this past fall that I graduated from college. I remember getting my degree and thinking I've got my whole life in front of me. Now, 35 years later, I'm looking back and saying, I don't have a whole lot left to do. Time is running out. And when I get to thinking about the brevity of life, I end up saying, what's the purpose of life? This past week, my heart was saddened. Back the first part of the month, I'd gone over to Carrie Jen. I usually go over there on either Thursday nights or Friday nights and play the piano for all the residents. We sit there. In the lobby of Carrie Jen, I have my hymn books up there on the piano, and for usually about an hour and a half, I sit there and play old hymns. The residents love it. Those that love the Lord, they love to gather down there in the in the lobby area and sing along with the songs. I sit there and play and sing. 
for an hour and a half. I went over there back the first part of February and one of the ladies, I usually go in the dining hall, they're finishing up dining. When I went in there, one of the ladies was, was sitting at a table. She had, they had had a group of people come in and they made crafts. They took like a pipe cleaner and they strung beads on it, red and white beads. And the one that she made, she had taken that pipe cleaner and bent it into the form of a heart. And this elderly resident, who I later found out to be 91 years of age, she gave me her heart. She had tied a piece of yarn to it, looped it, and she said, you can take and you can hang that on your rear view mirror in your car and you can think about me. Well, I did. I took it out there to the car when I pitched that evening and I, I hung it over my rear view mirror. About two weeks later, I went in there and she wasn't there. And, and I talked to the receptionist and I says, I've missed this lady. Where is she? She says, oh, you didn't hear. She had a stroke. I said, no, I didn't know. How's she doing? She says, I, I don't know how she's doing. I didn't know the lady's last name. I went back there Thursday night, actually Friday night, because this Thursday night was jam session. I went back Friday night, and the receptionist said the lady passed away. Oh. Our lives are so brief. And I read from out of the Word of God that I didn't just come into this world to live a life and have a, have a good time and then die and then that's it. I end up thinking about people that all that they live for is the very next day to go and have a good time. And then I'm thinking, so you go and you have a good time and then you die and then what? The Word of God says that you didn't just come by accident. I, I, I am so opposed to this whole teaching of evolution. And by the way, it's a theory. It's a rather pathetic theory too. Because there isn't evidence to support it. I, I, I don't want to digress too much, but you will find that, yeah, there are changes within species, but scientists have not found one case of one species become another species. Not one! If evolution is such a great theory, it would seem like you could come up with at least one. They can't even come up with one! A cat never becomes a dog. A horse never becomes a pig. People never were monkeys, though some of them may act like it. And I appreciate from the Word of God that it tells us that, folks, we were created by a loving God that had a purpose, not only because when He created man and woman, He put them in the Garden of Eden, He says, you've got purpose. Your purpose is to do what I have asked you to do. And it also tells me that there in that garden that God had created a tree of life. And it says there, God removed them from the garden so that they didn't eat from the tree of life and live forever. But let me tell you, I believe this with all my heart. God did not create us to just live and have a life of a few good times, die, be buried in a grave, and that's the end of us. I give thanks that in the Old Testament I find out that God created me with an eternal purpose. Not to live just a short period of time, but to live in fellowship with Him forever. In the Old Testament they thought that they could end up being made right with God by living according to the law. But what the Old Testament shows me, all the way through the book of the Old Testament, from Genesis through Malachi, it shows that no matter how hard people try, you and I can never live up to the laws of God. As it says in the Word of God, even if you manage to get every single one of the laws right, and you mess up one time, you still messed up. And because you messed up, you're not eligible for heaven. 
Heaven is a place for perfection. It's a place where the imperfect will not be welcomed. And when I read in the Old Testament, when I go through the Old Testament, and it, it's divided up into neat sections. I mean, if I had to choose what part of the Old Testament that I value the most, it would probably be the history part of it. I like the history. And the history part of it runs Genesis up through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. That's the history part of the Old Testament. Some people here might say, well, Pastor Tim, we figured that you would like the middle part, which is the literature. It's the songs. Did you would enjoy that the most? I guess I enjoy it to a point. But I probably enjoy the history. And then once you get through the songs, you've got, you know, Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Song. And once you get through that, then you go into prophecy. And there's some people that just absolutely love prophecy. But the Bible is divided up so that we can benefit from it. And when I read these stories from the Old Testament that I love, I learn how to take and learn from those stories, the Old Testament. Just like this morning, if you didn't make it to our Sunday school class, we looked at how Joseph dealt with forgiving his brothers when they showed up before him down in Egypt. Well, I just want to say for me, this Bible is a way that connects me with God that helps me understand my place in this world that God has created and how he wants me to live. It's what the Old Testament does for me. And in the New Testament, what it does for me is it introduces me to God on a personal level. Because we believe that when Jesus came, that was God coming here. To be one of us. So that we could know God. Not in some distant way. You know in the Old Testament. When Moses wanted to have an encounter with God. I mean the whole place was filled with the Shekinah glory of God. And when the other Israelites. One time they said they wanted to meet God. When God showed up on top of the mountain. It scared those people to death. And they came to Moses. They said Moses do us a favor. Whenever you want to meet with God. You go talk with him. But. <laughs> He's too much for us. The Old Testament shows this distant God. In the New Testament, I see the presence of God amongst us. Jesus' name is what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. And I find that God really does love me. He cares about what I'm going through. You see the care of God in the life of Jesus when he came to the people that were sick, whether it was somebody that was blind, whether it was somebody that was lame, whether it was somebody that was deaf, whether it was somebody that couldn't speak. And you see that Jesus cared for that person. He would touch them and heal them. You see Jesus in the New Testament caring about whether or not people have something to eat. And he looks at his disciples and said, these people are hungry. What do we have that we can feed these people with? And one of the disciples says, my goodness, Jesus, even if we had 200 denarii worth of bread, that wouldn't even be enough to give each person a bite. And Jesus says, well, what do you have? Well, the little boy here has small lunch. He's got five little loaves and two small fishes, but that's not even enough for Corey for a snack. <laughs> And Jesus said, well, bring it here and let me see what I can do with it. I need one point. And Jesus takes that and he holds it up there to Father. He says, Father, I, I want to thank you for this. And I want to ask your blessing upon it. And having asked the blessing upon it, man, oh man, did God ever bless it. He takes and he breaks that stuff apart, starts passing it out. Over 5,000 men ate as much as they wanted. And that didn't count the women and children. You see the care of Jesus. And he cares about whether or not our basic needs are met, whether we have something to eat. And I see more clearly than anything when Jesus went to the cross. The night before he, he went to the cross, after he'd had a Passover meal with his disciples, he took some bread and he broke it, symbolically saying to the disciples, symbolically saying, this bread represents my body 
which is going to be broken for you. Because God cares for you. Do you understand that somebody is going to have to pay for your sins? And Jesus was saying, I'm willing to be the person that does it. I will allow my body to be beaten. I will allow my body to be nailed to that cross. I will allow my body to be spit upon and mocked and ridiculed. And after taking that bread, he took a cup with some juice in it, and he says, and this, this isn't really juice. This is a new covenant, a new testament. You are not made right with God by living according to the law of the Old Testament. You are made right with God by faith in my atoning blood, which is going to be poured out on that cross. Jesus says, without the shedding of this blood, there is no remission of sin. I want you to take and drink this cup as a reminder. My blood has been shed so that you can be washed white in God's sight. Am I clean because of my righteousness? No. Some might say that this is not the way to accurately quote the Old Testament, but I believe with all my heart my righteousness is as filthy rags. Jesus took my filthiness upon himself. And here's the other side of the equation. Jesus didn't just take our sins upon himself. He took all of his righteousness and he clothed us in his righteousness. I am not saved by what I have done. I am saved because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. I love the Word of God because it tells me, it gives me two pictures of God. In Old Testament, it points out the holiness of the God that we serve and how far we all fall short of being the people he's called us to be. That's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, I see a God who loved me so much that he did give his only begotten son that if I will believe in him, I will not perish, but I will have everlasting life. You remember what I've said to you many times before. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Why do I make the distinction? Because as much as we may not want to admit to it, Jesus says it's true. There is not a one of us that's good. We all stand in need of forgiveness. And that's the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gave us when he died on the cross. I love the word of God. I love the Old Testament. I really love the New Testament. The psalmist said, Oh, how I love your word. I pray that we as the people of God might learn to love and cherish the Word of God. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, and will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and hide its words in my heart 
that I might not sin against thee. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you might help us to treasure it more. We thank you that we learn about you. We thank you that we learn about your purpose for us. We're thankful, Father, that your word assures us that your purpose for us was not just 70 years and then that's the end. We're thankful that your word reveals to us that your purpose for us is eternal. That you invite us to become a part of your family through faith in your son Jesus Christ for what he did on Calvary's cross. That he died for our sins. That we might be forgiven and accepted and given the gift of eternal life. Pray, Father, that you might help us to live our lives in constant fellowship with you, that we might take your word to heart, that we might learn to, to live by it and allow it to make us into the image of your Son, who is the living word. Take us and make us like Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, we'll turn to page 488, just as I am. Move your boxes around. Yeah. Uh, YouTube. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Tony. Thank you, Tony, to this video. If you like this this okay, service today. Like, subscribe. Please come back to you can watch another video. And uh, God bless. Enjoy having a nice day. Got a new phone?